Thank you very much. Uh, I will not say anything about myself because it's a pretty nasty topic anyway. But I'd like to say this, that uh, I believe the time is something like five minutes to nine, so therefore um, we will start this meeting with a five minute uh, prayer for world peace and enlightenment. Uh, I've started a world campaign uh, on this and I'm asking all people uh, to cooperate with this at nine o'clock every day. Now, <clears throat> the type of prayer we will use tonight is Keith Robertson will read uh, one of the 12 blessings from the book, um, the New Age Bible, which was given through me as a channel by Jesus. Um, he will read uh, the first, or the, say, the second blessing uh, this, this night. Um, and during this time, should you wish, uh, would you uh, be kind enough to uh, visualize a white light leaving yourself, straightforward visualization, white light leaving yourself, and then detach yourself from uh, the light from then on, put it that way. Uh, we hope to perform a, a campaign, world campaign, in this respect, so that every hour of the day and night for 24 hours, someone somewhere in the world is sending out, spending five minutes sending out prayer in their own way, whatever way they choose, for world peace and enlightenment. And I think this is the least we can as decent human beings uh, uh, do. I think this is the absolute minimum, uh, certainly not the maximum. So if you uh, do wish to take part in this, and you have free will to choose or reject, but should you wish to take part in this, and should you ask for some advice, uh, I can only tell you that that mudra, or that hand position, is not the correct position for prayer. Uh, I won't tell you why the Christians have adopted it, but I will say that it is not the correct position. Um, as a yogi, I have been initiated into mudra, and I know about hand signs. And I know that they are particularly important. You can make a man live with hand signs, you can kill him with hand signs. They are as important as that, the difference between life and death. So if you wish to allow power to throw, flow through you in an unobstructed manner, that is the position of the hands for prayer. In this way, you do not inhibit the heart center which is here, neither do you inhibit the two chakras in the palms of the hands. You are uninhibited, unrestricted channel through which power or universal life force or love, call it what you like, it doesn't matter what name you give it, it can flow. Uh, I'll ask Keith then to come to the front and read this. <coughs> The mark of Jesus. <clears throat> oh, my adorable children, may your hearts and minds be filled with love and wisdom, so that you may radiate this light of God throughout your earth. Blessed are the wise ones, for they walk through a dark and ignorant world, spreading their light, so that all who want to, so that all who are ready may see, even though blindly, some facet of the face of God some small part of his work. Thrice blessed are these wise ones. These are the ones who have gone within, deep within, and made a glorious and lasting contact with the spark which dwelleth there. The self-same spark which came from the heart of the mighty Logos 
from the heart of He and it which fashioned even the Logos. Thrice blessed are the wise ones in the now and by now. Yet what bliss they sacrificed for man. These ones have found peace and have turned away from it to give its very essence, its very core to searching, groping, unpeaceful man. These are the great ones. But without these, this world could not endure. Christ blessed are the searchers who have found and left and given of their very heart to man so that he may see and seeing know and knowing act and acting become that which he should be. So endeth the second blessing. O adorable children, children of God, walk bravely forward to your salvation. Look neither to one side nor the other, but straight ahead into the very face of God and contact this mighty light so that it may shine upon you, so that it may impregnate you forever. Be this now, by now. Adorable ones, little children, I am here with you. I will lead you into this state if you will but hold out your hand to me. Adorable ones, go with God. about the third satellite. By the third satellite I do not refer to these tin cans sent up by the Russian government, neither do I refer to the tin cans which you people have paid for, although you didn't have much say in the matter, or the 50 ball bearings that you people have paid for, although you had no say in the matter, sent up by the American government. I refer to a satellite which is a wonderful spacecraft and a satellite which is not always in orbit of this Earth but does come in occasionally <coughs> for a very definite reason. Now, first of all, I refer to it as the third satellite. Well, it is the third satellite. And there are two satellites in continuous orbit of this Earth. They are there for 24 hours a day, day in and day out, month in and month out, year in and year out. And the American government, like the British government and the Russian government and every other government on Earth who has radar systems, knows of the existence of these two man-made satellites which have been orbiting this Earth for some years. Brave people like Major Donald Keogh, late of Air Force Intelligence, uh, comes forward quite definitely and openly and told the people of this country that he knew that the government knew of the existence of these two satellites. One of them orbits about 750 miles away from the surface of the Earth, and the other is about I think it varies between about 2,500 miles away and a little less than that. This is 
classified information. It's information classified for some reason or another by the governments of the world, uh, possibly because they do not wish to inform their electorate that there are uh, greater people in this universe than they are. This may be a reason. I think that the reason is political, whatever it be. Being a man who is not interested at all in politics, save to see them as the foul things that they are, um, we let that ride. But whether the governments will admit this fact openly or not, they do know that these satellites are there. Now, I have been uh, just as outspoken about these as Donald Keogh, uh, certainly more outspoken about them than anyone else in England. I have spoken about these two satellites over the state-controlled radio of Britain on a national coverage, and not once has an Air Force official come along to me and <coughs> denied the fact that these do exist. I think that too is a clever move on the part of the Royal Air Force in as much as they do like a channel, uh, strangely enough, uh, through which certain information can be released. Now, they wouldn't back up the fact that they know they exist, but they have never once denied their existence. And for a person who has spoken to Britain uh, in, the outs in the straightforward manner in which I'll speak to you uh, tonight, it's rather interesting that the Air Force have made no official denial of this. They've had every opportunity, uh, but they have not done so. The Two satellites are, we are informed, by people who uh, belong to the planets from which they came, traveling classrooms. And it's a joke of us in London, we believe that if they are traveling classrooms and if there are pupil, pupils on these classrooms, that the pupils are told to observe the Earth very, very carefully and they are told that after they have done this, uh, that is what not to be like. Uh, that's our joke, and uh, we don't expect even the space people to laugh at it, uh, but um, possibly uh, something like that goes on there. Uh, I know that from these satellites, uh, metaphysical and, and uh, astrophysical survey is carried on, uh, and I know that as a result of this survey from the two satellites and the third satellite, every man on Earth is known. There's not a man or woman or child in this room tonight who is not known quite completely by people from other planets, people who are not very far away from this town tonight. You are known completely. They these people know what you were in the last life and what you will be in the next. They know the whole import of your existence upon this earth and other earths upon which you will exist when you have passed the necessary initiations. Now these <coughs> dossiers <coughs> are quite complete and they will never be used in evidence against you in any way. <coughs> They are not made up for any belligerent reason, but for a definite reason which, sooner or later, each one of you will know about. The third satellite, though, <coughs> is a large object which was originally built on Mars, I don't know when, is manned by <coughs> advanced metaphysicians, mainly from the planet Mars, the, it's under the control, strict control, of a person who is living on the planet Mars, which is a very friendly planet. And <clears throat> this satellite varies its orbit. It is not always in orbit of this Earth. Sometimes 
it is out of orbit and other times it is in orbit. It has a very, very definite function to perform. And the function is this. As I said last night, the space people can see this world as a world which needs very, very great help. Now, their hands are tied to a certain extent. There is a law, a basic law which governs all things, and that law makes this statement. And whether we like it or not makes no difference. The law still makes this statement, despite our petty likes and our petty dislikes. The statement is this. <coughs> Action and reaction are opposite and equal. In other words, it is the law of karma. Jesus referred to it in a brilliant way when he said, as you sow, so shall you reap. If you cast mildewed bread upon the waters, in many days mildewed bread will be returned to you. I'm not good bread. This, whether we like it or not, Because the karmic balance or karmic pattern of this world is as it is, the space people may not intervene except in an indirect way. And their intervention in this uh, respect, in the respect of the third satellite and in all other respects, is an indirect intervention. They recognize the fact that mankind upon earth has chosen, and I'm picking my words quite carefully here, has chosen to hang on to his free will, has chosen to exercise his free will, so therefore they may not interfere with this choice. And indeed they will not interfere with the choice of free will of man upon this earth. Certainly not directly, certainly not indirectly. The only interference, if it can be called that, will be to state a case to mankind, which they have been doing through numerous channels for 18,800,000 years. But it is a statement of a case only. It is no force behind it. Mankind can reject this case or accept it as he chooses. This pattern must be taken through the whole gamut. The third satellite may not, and no one on the third satellite may not interfere with the choice of anyone upon this earth. This would be co a contravention of the law because man is in the position that he is in today. So therefore, the operators of the third satellite offer to mankind that which he needs. I said last night that they have a picture of mankind something like this. On the one hand you have a great materialistic conspiracy and conspiracy it is. Let me just illustrate in a few short words what I mean by that. I do not mean that if people have $20,000 in the bank, they're this, that, and the other wicked. Not that. But the materialistic conspiracy goes very much deeper than this. A great force exists, not actually on this earth, but in what we call the lower astral realms of this earth. And from this force, various pawns upon this earth are directed. Pawns like Hitler, Himmler, Mussolini, Napoleon, Stalin, and people like that were directed from this great center of black magic, great center of evil. In fact, the black magician who arranged the murder of Jesus 
years before he came to this planet, is still alive on this earth in a physical body. I don't think there is a book written on earth that you will find that in except Cosmic Voice, but you can take it from me, it is true. Brilliant minds, minds the like of which the ordinary man cannot conceive of, are directing the policy of this earth and people and governments are but no not all people some people and some governments are but pawns in their hands and you get a weak man like hitler and he can be used as a pawn to commit the foul atrocities that hitler was either directly or indirectly responsible for Atrocities which Hitler himself could not think of, did not think of, but was a channel for this great evil force. An evil force fed by the majority of thought of ordinary human man upon earth. It's quite a statement. It's a terrible, terrible statement to make. Few people have ever made a worse one. And yet, it is a true one. On the other hand, we have those who, in many, many ways, in many, many religions, in many, many countries throughout this earth, are helping all they know how, to the best of their ability, to bring an upliftment, a spiritual upliftment, a spiritual enlightenment to this earth. They are grossly outnumbered. So outnumbered that I've given these people a name and I refer to them as the thin white line. The thin white line with their backs against the wall shot to pieces the remnants of spiritualized terrestrial men. This thin white line lacks one thing. They do not lack courage. They have it. They are great, great, wonderful people. Even though they may be quite ordinary people. They may range from newsboys to directors of uh, concerns. They're wonderful people. The space people refer to them as the glorious few, which, coming from a spaceman, heaps great honor upon their heads. They're people who serve mankind in many, many ways throughout the world. They're people who often sacrifice, make great sacrifices themselves in order to help the natives in the swamps of the Belgium Congo sometimes, in order to go to the ends of the earth to help others. There are other people who serve in the slums. There are other people who can't do either of these but pray often. The glorious few. Now, I said that there was something that these people needed, and there is. There's something they badly need. And that is energy. If there's one thing that the space people have taught us beyond all doubt, it is this, that all energy which is expended is really and truly sacred. And that L-O-V-E is the name of a very potent energy. They have stripped the emotional emotional emotionalism from this 
word L-O-V-E and given us the picture of as this as an energy, of this as an energy. It's like electricity. We could not light one lamp in this room unless we had an electrical source. Even if we had an electrical source in this room as a potential, we still could not light one lamp unless those lamps were co connected to that source in the right way. If they were connected to that source by pieces of string, they still would not light. It, would, it needs wires or conductors of electricity in order to connect those lamps to the source. This is so obvious. The energy, L-O-V-E, is all pervasive energy. It belongs to no man, to no planet, to no system, to no galaxy, to no system of galaxies. It is all pervasive. It comes from the very Godhead itself down through all the cycles of manifestation back through to the Godhead itself again. But we have to connect ourselves up to the source in the right way in order to be able to use this all-pervasive and greatest of all everlasting energy. It's the energy which is radiated from the sun. And the space people <coughs> know this. They know it to such an extent that they have <coughs> gone out of their way to offer us or the thin white line a definite direct source of this energy. A source made readily available. Now, up until <coughs> uh, even a few years ago, a man or woman, in order to <coughs> contact a vast amount of energy, needed to have certain initiations, needed to spend five or six hours a day as a very, very minimum at certain mystic practices such as yoga and various other practices. I will not say that man doesn't need to spend five hours a day at yoga now in order to contact vast energies. But I will say that when the third satellite is in orbit of this Earth, energies are more readily available to those people who may not have the time or opportunity to spend five or six hours a day in the practice of yoga. Energies are made readily available to all men, irrespective of class, color, creed, or religion, whether they can write or not, whether they can sit in Padma and perform any yogic practice whatsoever. No, that's incorrect whether they can sit in Padma and perform any deep mystic yogic practice whatsoever. <coughs> so the thin white line need energy and the space people are unable to land en masse upon this earth because man has chosen to use this petty free will, this useless thing this useless garment, really, if you study it very carefully. He's chosen to use this. So therefore, he has closed the doors for any outside intervention. Just as surely as if our dear hostess tonight had closed the doors against us, we could not be here. We have closed the doors of this earth of ours against direct intervention. Number one, by our karmic pattern, but number two, mainly because of our choice to govern ourselves by using this so-called free will. A free will, by the way, my friends, which will never lead to freedom. I am not going to explain this night 
what I exactly mean by that statement, but would refer you to an issue of cosmic voice and refer you to a great speech given by a Martian when he spoke about freedom. And you will see there the great difference between free will and freedom. <coughs> Not only has mankind chose to use this free will, but he's chose to use it wrongly. He could heal cancer tomorrow, but what will he do tomorrow? Spend another $50 million on bursting another atom bomb? He could heal all starvation upon this earth within a week. But what will he do within a week? Spend another hundred million dollars or English pounds or Russian rubles on some improvement to the army, navy or air forces of the world. Mankind has closed his doors. This earth is almost alone in the whole planetary system, but not quite. Because of the few, this thin white line, it cannot be left alone. The thin white line are people who often have sunk petty like and dislike to perform some service or other, whatever it might be. But there are thousands of ways of doing it upon this earth. People who need energy. The third satellite will come into orbit of this earth very shortly in order to give those people energy. Now it operates in a very fair way. The people upon the third satellite do not differentiate between an American and a Russian, an American and a red Chinese, providing both of these people are in some way doing a spiritual a task. They will not differentiate uh, between an Englishman and an Eskimo, providing those two people are doing in some way a spiritual task. And by a spiritual task I mean this, a task done in the right motive. And there is only one motive, and the motive is this, a task performed in service to others. In service to others if that task cooperates with the law. It would not be a spiritual task if someone believes that if he killed 40 people he could save 41. This would not be a spiritual task. A spiritual task is that done in selfless service to others, providing the law is cooperated with, and the law makes several quite definite statements. Krishna, Buddha, and Jesus agreed upon all points, and they most certainly agreed upon this, thou shalt harm no living thing. One of the commandments given to Moses was thou shalt not kill, and whosoever does kill for any reason at all is wrong whether it be to defend his so-called country, to defend his so-called home, or to defend his so-called wife, or whether it be a wife to defend her so-called husband. Thou shalt not kill, or thou shalt harm no living thing, is one of the basic commandments of all religions, great religions upon this earth. And uh, all thinkers know that there is little or no difference between mystic Hinduism, mystic Buddhism, and mystic Christianity. There were religions or statements of law given by three spacemen. Krishna, Buddha, and Jesus. Krishna came from Saturn, he was the greatest. Buddha and Jesus came from Venus. They were great masters, but not quite of the initiatory ability of Sri Krishna. And both of them, if ever you gain, if you are privileged to gain communication with them, will tell you this beyond any doubt. And if they should deny this, then question the source of your information. 
So a third satellite then gives to you great energy, as much energy as you can possibly use. You will never drain this battery dry because the energy comes to the satellite from <coughs> the holiest being in this planetary system, which is the sun. I said the holiest being. I didn't say a great ball of flame. I said a living, breathing being, which the sun is. It is not only the father of all of us, but it is the father of all the planets as well. In case you get the word father wrong, do not think I say that the sun is God or the absolute. It is not. The absolute is that which contains all things good, bad, or indifferent. There is one supreme source which contains all other things and only that one source. But the sun is the nearest thing to that supreme source in this solar system. And man upon this earth, <coughs> physical man, mental man, and psychic man but not spiritual man. The three lower aspects of man is really only solidified sunlight. Take that into your meditations with you, and if you do ever meditate at all, that key can unlock the door of great, great mysteries for you. Now, I'll <clears throat> try to give you a little idea. We have made some color slides of the drawings uh, which were done by Robertson <coughs> under my direction of the third satellite. First of all, might I say that when it is in orbit of the, this Earth, it is not visible and it cannot be tracked by radar. The way that they a rendering visibility is very simple. If I hold that up there, all people can see it. And what do you see? You see the photons emitted by the electric light in this room, reflected from that material. These photons enter the lenses which you have in your head called your eyes, impress themselves on the brain in a certain way, and you regard that as a book. If I cut off the streams of photons by turning off the lights, you do not see that book. But supposing I put the lights on, and instead of letting the photons bombard or letting the photons reflect from that book to you, supposing I was to turn those photons in a 360 degree arc through some magnetic field. I could hold that book up all night. You could use what arc lamps on it you like and you would not see it. The third satellite is rendered invisible in this way, that the photons reflected from it are evolved around the fourth screen which is completely surrounding the craft. It cannot be tracked by radar. Why? Well, a radar works in this way. Pulses of energy are sent out by an emitter or through a transmitting apparatus. These pulses of energy soar through space until they hit a certain object. And then they are reflected back and are received in a receiver. And on an oscilloscope screen, you see a shadow of this object. The third satellite operators take the radar pulses into the force shield around the object <coughs> so that they will not be reflected back on the oscilloscope screen. And there's a good reason for it. 
they don't just do it in order to show off their ability. They do it for a very good reason, and this is the reason. Some time ago, the Aetherius Society informed major military centers throughout the earth, in Russia, just as well as we did in America, that radar operators should be extremely careful what they scanned in space. If radar operators scanned radioactive clouds for a long time, then it was possible that the radar operator could become contaminated by the radioactivity from the cloud. I don't suppose any of these military establishments took any notice. They certainly didn't make any officially thank the Aetherius Society for giving them this news. But strangely enough, since this time, we have heard of many, many sudden deaths of radar operators, which were totally unexplained in the press. And I know three radar operators <coughs> working on atomic experimentation who had a queer rash come on their bodies, a rash which is incurable by any known scientific means. It is the rash which sometimes denotes leukemia, <coughs> which, as you know, is cancer of the blood caused by strontium-90 radiation. I believe many radar operators have died or been afflicted by incurable disease over this last few years. And I believe when the space people gave this warning, they gave it as a timely warning in order to, to preserve life. Because even though they do not, they may not agree with a militarist, they would still go out of their way <coughs> to tell that man how he could protect his own life and protect his, his own body and so on from death or disease. If this happens with a radioactive cloud, it also happens with any, any form of energy which might be good. If the people in the third satellite were allow, were to allow the radar pulses to return to Earth after being bombarding the satellite, this allowance would interfere with the very, very delicate and subtle manipulations that they are carrying on from that satellite. I'll now show these color slides and tell you uh, a wee bit more about the workings of this satellite. And I must ask a good lady there if she would mind very much just moving her chair. <coughs> <coughs> Now these are rough chalk, chalk drawings of this thing. First of all, we have this huge egg-shaped satellite. It's shaped like an egg, which by the way is the most significant shape in the macrocosmic system. Strange to say that no birth, either on this or any other planet, can take place without this egg. If you know anything about basic biology on this Earth, you know that. If you know anything about advanced biology on other planets, you also know that. This is the, the ultimate shape in this system. And it's significant that the third satellite should be another egg shape. Now here we have, again, this egg. We have here a huge dome, and here a matrix. Now, this dome here is made of crystalline substance. What it is, I do not know. I have seen it, and I know that you can see through it without any distortion at the edges, which you would get through that thickness, because it appears to be thick, that thickness of glass. 
It is a pure crystalline substance. How it was made, I do not know. Except I believe it was grown to a certain specification. Now, through here comes the rays of the sun. Now, they cannot send the rays of the sun down through this power matrix directly without certain conditioning. They have a involved or evolved system of filters which cover that dome. Now, when we want to alter a light frequency, we take a colored glass and put in front of the light and we alter the frequency to something we call blue or green or red, whatever color the glass may be. But these people do not need to do that. <coughs> they simply charge that with an energy. And that energy alters the frequency of light which is allowed to enter through this dome. Now, before this process can take place, they must know exactly what energies are needed on Earth at what time. That is why the complete dossier needs to be kept on individuals upon this Earth to know what energies are needed so that they can provide them in this great power station. The energies come in, conditioned, when they come in, and are radiated out through this matrix. It's not by chance we put a cross work on there. A certain very important space pattern has that same crosswalk, an intersection of parallel lines at 90 degrees. You can ask me questions about that afterwards, but I shall be very careful as to what answers I give. Here we have a more descriptive drawing, and uh, I must be honest about this, here's America down there receiving all that energy proving that there's all these good people in America receiving it. When I speak in South Africa <coughs> or Australia, it'll be Australia down there, so don't kid yourself. <laughs> now here we have the sun's, uh, this crystal dome, and underneath the crystal dome are three large pyramid formations. These two are made of crystal. The strange part about this crystal is this, that these glow from the inside out. You know that a diamond has to be cut and polished in a certain way in order to reflect light. It reflects and refracts light and it glows as blue and, and uh, green and heliotrope and so on when it splits the light rays up which reflect upon it. But these don't operate like that at all. They seem to have an inner fire, and they, the inner fire comes from the inside out, unlike a diamond, our diamond upon Earth, which purely and simply reflects light. If you turned off all the lights, these crystals would still glow with this tremendous, vibrant fire. They are about, I think, about seven foot tall. They are three-sided pyramids and not four-sided pyramids. The rays come down here, are absorbed in some way into those crystals. The crystals vibrate at a certain frequency. Then the rays pass off up here to another huge type of crystal formation, which again looks like a huge egg around which revolve multi-shaped crystals. The strange part about this thing is that it is not supported in any way. It just hangs there. It's possibly about 15 to 20 feet high and it just stays there. And I believe that if you fire a <coughs> shell point blank at that thing, I don't think you'll move it a fraction of an inch some great force which is totally invisible, unknown to people upon this earth, keeps it in place. And these crystals 
revolve round it without any visible means of support mm -hmm. slowly. They don't revolve round fast. By the way, I'd like to say that these drawings may not be reproduced in any articles and so on. The Theorist Society holds world copyright on it. Um, these revolve round that central crystal, if it is a crystal. And from there, the energy comes into the matrix which sends it to Earth. Now, the most weird, and I say weird and really I mean it, the most weird part about this whole operation is this. We have here light coming in, uh, vibrating these crystals, conditioning the light or the energy in a certain way. Here again we have a secondary <coughs> conditioning of the energy. Up to then it appears to be light, but, and this is the weird part, from here to here it seems to flow like liquid. One of the most staggering things I have ever noticed in outer space I have seen a beam of light travel between point A and point B. I have seen a pole there and a pole at the back of the room there and have seen a beam of light travel slowly between the two poles. You can't explain it. It's a really weird feeling. You can never see anything like that on this earth, but I have seen it. And this light appears to flow like water or liquid to the matrix and from then on again I believe it reaches uh, its uh, I believe it reaches a certain very high velocity probably many many more times the speed of light which is reckoned as 186,000 miles per second I believe the velocity of the energy when it comes from those crystals is above that of light Here we have a drawing of an individual which may be seven foot tall in comparison with these pyramids. And you have this massive, <coughs> massive color. And all this, by the way, is in contained in one small part of this satellite, and it's massive. It's not small. The whole thing is big. And the first thing one notices when they come in here is not the machinery, but the perfect. You can smell these energies, and these energies are particularly beautiful. And there we have the action. Conditioning the sun's rays here, another type of conditioning here, another type of conditioning here, and down. To every man, woman, and child upon earth, who is performing some spiritual action, doesn't matter whether it's in a Roman Catholic church or a Buddhist monastery <coughs> or a Buddhist temple, it makes no difference. Providing it's a selfless action with the right motive done on behalf of some other person. Uh, that's all we've got. Yeah. That's all the drawings. <coughs> That's all the, the drawings we did. Well, that gives you some <coughs> very small idea of this particular satellite and how the energies are used. <coughs> now, I said that this satellite would be in orbit of this Earth, and I most certainly intend to give you the date. Some of you who were there last night have the dates, but I would ask you to please be uh, patient. Oh, all right, please. Please be patient while I give these dates out again. Before I do, I'd like to just say a word or two more about this importance. <coughs> If you are engaged in any type of spiritual work at all with 
selfless spiritual work with the right motive. Even if it is, even if it is um, uh, personal advancement, providing again the motive is right, and by the way, you cannot kid the troops in this respect. The people manipulating the energies from the third satellite know your motives. You may think you do. These people definitely do. So you can't say, well, my motive is this, that, and the other, if it's X, Y, Z. So even if it is, uh, uh, a mo even, even if it is for personal, uh, advancement or personal enlightenment, providing that is sought with the right motive, these energies will directly, directly help you in every possible way. And they will help you like this. I gave, I'll give you again the same little illustration as I gave last night because I can't better it. Let us take a hypothetical case. <coughs> Let us take a case of Mrs. A. We'll take Mrs. A because women are more spiritual than men anyway. We'll take the case, for instance, of Mrs. or Mr. A. Call her Mrs. A. Now, Mrs. A has heard that her friend Mrs. B has had an, os uh, has had an accident and is in hospital. So what does she do? She may pray in her own way, whatever it is, she chooses what way to do it, may pray for her friend so that she gets better. She doesn't only pray, she does other things as well, like visits her in hospital, but one thing she does do is to pray and send out some power or love to her friend in hospital. And, but, uh, don't make a noise there. By praying, Mrs. A releases a stream of energy towards her friend. Because after all, what is prayer? Prayer is a way to direct energy by thought. And one predetermines the way. When one says certain words, it means that one directs their mind in a certain channel. These words have a meaning of vibration. This vibration is then directed from Mrs. A to Mrs. B. It's simple to understand, and that is what prayer is, by the way. It, it's a science, is prayer. It's nothing airy-fairy. It's just as much a science as, as any other thing is a science. Now, Mrs. A releases, in 15 minutes prayer, shall we say, X units of energy in order to help Mrs. B in a normal time of the year. When the third satellite is in orbit, providing Mrs. A has clear, pure motives, she will not release X units of energy towards Mrs. B in order to help her, but she will release 3,000 X units of energy towards Mrs. B in order to help her. So all spiritual practices are enhanced <coughs> 3,000 times during the time that this satellite is in orbit of the world. Now here is a vast, vast energy potential coil, an energy potential that you can use in every possible way. But an energy potential which will not help you to get a better job, particularly, a bigger and better Cadillac, particularly, or even a Ford particularly. Uh, <laughs> Molly knows I'm going to make a crack at our old ranch wagon, so she's looking at me rather askant at the moment. I mean, if tuning in to the third satellite energies would help me to get a bigger and better car, that wouldn't be an old Ford ranch wagon out there. It would be a gold-plated, not even a Cadillac, a gold-plated Rolls Royce because I've done it plenty of times. No, but it will help you to help others in whatever way it is, or help you to advance yourself 
providing that advancement is brought about with the right motive. And normal spiritual advancement is sought after with the right motive. And I give you the dates. All times, by the way, are Greenwich, me are midnight Greenwich mean time. So a dime in a phone box will, to any air company, a big air company, will give you the equivalent in Cleveland time. I don't know what it would be here, but Greenwich mean time. Five hours earlier, 7 p.m. here corresponds to... Uh, well, that's it. <clears throat> that's it. Then a gentleman's already worked it out for us, so it will be 7 p.m. All times are 7 p.m. Standard time. If we use daylight time, it would be 8 p.m. Yeah. S uh, 7 p.m. standard time. If it's daylight time, it will be use 8. It will be 8 p.m. Thank you very much. That saved me. February the 25th until April the 25th. February the 25th until April the 25th. And after 7 p.m., April the 25th, it's gone. And away off it goes. It may go anywhere, but it's gone. Come back again, June the 5th, <coughs> until August the 9th, June 5 until August the 9th, and away off it goes again, and it returns September the 30th to November the 30th. That's February 25 to April 25, the first one, second is June 5 to August 9, third is September 30 to November 30. If you haven't got these times and dates down, don't worry. Uh, you can get them afterwards from Keith Robertson or Monique Noppy. We're the only two. Please go out of our way to make sure you do get these dates and times. Now, during all those times, for 24 hours a day, because the space people don't sleep, for 24 hours a day, this satellite is there. And if you go about your practice, Forget the fact that it's there, if you like. You no need to tune into it or to go into uh, any kind of a weird and wonderful posture or anything like that. This isn't necessary. But whenever you are performing any spiritual practice, an individual beam will be put on you. Now, my friends, before I go any further, may I just say this. You will not, repeat not, underline the word not, put a capital N before the word not, get a message from this satellite. You must not repeat, not even seek a message from this satellite because it's energy wasting, but we'll get something far, far more valuable, that is a beam of energy. And if you are attuned at all, you will feel, physically feel, physically feel this energy course through you as a vibrant power. There is no doubt about whether you will physically feel it or not. You will. I can be categorical and make this statement. You will. If you don't, then indeed, don't tell me because you're telling me that you're a rarity. I'm not a good one at that. I have not, we have not received one letter at the Therius House, to my knowledge, from a person anywhere on earth who has honestly told us that they have, they have performed some spiritual practice during the time the satellite has been there who has not said they felt that extra benefit, that extra uplift, that extra vibration. I have to yet have the first letter. Or put it this way, I have to yet see the first letter myself. I think that is right. I don't ever remember seeing a letter.
from anyone. And this is quite, quite a unique. Whenever one talks about spiritual energies, you always get some people come up and say, oh, well, I didn't that, or I couldn't that, or I wasn't the other. But I haven't seen them. If they've come to the Aetherist Society, then I haven't seen them. So there it is. A great call, a great, tremendous energy awaits you if you use it. You can be in a, a group at a theatre, and if you're the only one performing spiritual practice in that theatre, an individual beam will be put on you. You won't see it. In size, it's something like the thousandth part of a hair, a thousandth part as wide as a hair of your head in size. But it's there. It's powerful. It's extremely potent. The more you practice spiritual work, the more you do it, the more you use these energies, the more will be given to you. If any of you <coughs> contemplate any great spiritual move, if you contemplate starting groups and things like that, then this is, these are the dates to make such a start. Or, if you make a start beforehand, have everything ready so that on these dates you can go into battle, as it were. It is known that if you are doing this, you are one of what the space people call the glorious few. And no matter what odds seem to be against you, and God knows the odds are bad enough, but no matter what odds they are, eventually you will win. There is no doubt about this. Eventually, light will transmute darkness. There is no doubt about this. Whosoever thinks otherwise doesn't think deep enough, doesn't think long enough, doesn't know enough. If we keep on sending out this light, this energy, we will cause a great transmutation of the dark forces upon this earth. We will cause them to be transmuted so that they themselves can enter the realms of light. Instead of being against us, they will then be for us. <clears throat> A few years ago, you all would have had to work extremely hard to know such significant information as this. But the space people have seen fit because of their great love for mankind to tear down the doors of the secret mystery school and lay open information to the ordinary man and woman so that he may use it or reject it as he sees fit.